This time on episode 458 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we discuss the 1992 X-Men animated series season 5, episodes 1 and 2, as presented on Disney+, Plus, and weekly, or in this case monthly, Marvel Studio News. I'm Doc. Issues from Capes on the Couch, a show that examines the mental health issues of comic book characters, part of the Gunna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other amazing geeky shows at GunnaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the shield director. Now it's time for a scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. And I'm producer of the show, Director SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're a Marvel Comic Universe fan show discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Marvel Comic Book Universes as told on screen by the phenomenal Marvel Studios. This show was recorded on Saturday, Saturday, January 21st, 2023, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast electric view wide. Come and join our live chat as we record. And if you didn't already catch on to it, we love talking about Marvel. Because of beards. If you want to see some people with some really cool beards, head on over to legendsofshield.com. If you want to leave us a voicemail about your favorite beard, you can do so by calling 844-THE-BUS-1. That's 844-843-2871. If you just want to show off your really cool beard, especially if you have one of those monkey tail ones, Make sure you tag us at legendsofshield.com. You can see SP's appearing, disappearing, appearing, disappearing beard on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash going to geek. If you want to talk to the disembodied beard of SP, sometimes you can catch them over at our Discord server, going to slash Discord. And remember, Legends of Shield is a proud member of the going to geek.com network. Yeah, Michelle was like, yeah, it's not going to catch anybody. Michelle, you caught both of us there (laughs) with the beard comment. That's great. Lauren wanted to be with us here today. She could not be with us because she had another commitment, and we're happy for her for that, but she'll be back hopefully next week. It's been a couple weeks since we got together. That was because I took a little vacation. I went up to the tundra, you know, way up by Magneto, and I decided to try to ice fish. And it's it's a thing. It's a thing, especially up in Wisconsin and Minnesota, you know, right up close to the Arctic Circle. Closer than I've ever been. Did you catch any fish? Actually, we did. We caught a couple of northern, and it was... I don't know. It was worth it because I taught my nephew and my son how to ice fish or retaught them how to ice fish. And my son, actually, as we're recording right now, is ice fishing. So he caught on to it and he's having fun up there. Well, in the meantime, we're back in the studio and we're talking about some X-Men, the animated series. It's kind of a sad, sad day because we're starting the final season of the X-Men the Animated Series that was in the 90s. This is all in preparation for the X-Men the Animated Series 97 that's coming out probably early next year. I haven't seen an actual date for the premiere yet. Originally, I think they were thinking late 23, but I think we're thinking early or mid 24. But this is sad because this will be our last season. 10 episodes, we'll have five episodes, two at a time. Are you guys really sad? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But we do get to talk about him. So that's really cool. And we're going to do it right now. Previously on Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm so sad that we're coming to the end of the series. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. This just really seems like the end of an era. So the question is exactly in the X-Men 92 universe or the X-Men the animated series universe is how time travel actually works. 
Bishop is traveling through time and has an accident. Came out of nowhere, right? He's all like touching the tube and is like, I get to make the ultimate human race. And he's being all creepy. Because you could have genetic baby making focus combined with turning people into dinosaurs focus. You know, Chris, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur issue number two comes out next week. You're going to pick that one up. What is this, a science fiction convention? <laughs> We've been told it's a continuation. And I haven't seen season five yet, so I don't know how that applies to everything. Thank you very much for putting that together, Chris. That is a unique view on what we've got here with our last episode on X-Men the Animated Series. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, once I heard Michelle say that Bishop had an accident, it made me think of the pile of crap we're going to have for season five. Well, we're going to find out in just a little bit. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for putting that together. X-Men, the animated series, season five, episodes one and two premiered on Fox Kids in September of 1995. It was the Phalanx Covenant Part One and Phalanx Part Two. Michelle, what are the descriptions of the episodes? Phalanx Covenant Part One. The X-Men are attacked by the Phalanx, a race of techno-organic aliens seeking to assimilate all life on Earth. Phalanx Covenant Part 2. The X-Men are attacked by the Phalanx and are trying to find help, but Magneto at first sees this as his chance to watch humanity go down. All right, Chris, overall thoughts, what'd you think? I really, really loved the Wolverine focus. Ha, not really, yes, aspect of these two episodes. I loved how Beast was the prominent character and everything was solved by science. I love the good guy, bad guy team up basically within all of the mutants. And it was, it was cool. You, you know, you had Sinister, you had Magneto, you had Beast as part of the X-Men. You ha actually had a lot of characters that showed up. So this was all in the focus of countering one big threat. That's how people used to get, usually get together. And in the modern movies, this usually turns into some sort of twisting, like evil twist, like everybody's looking for their edge and stuff like that. We just didn't see that. So it was just simply a team up. They called each other for help. They fought it together and, and it turned out OK. It was a happy ending at the end. Not something that we'd see in a modern MCU movie that would be about the mutants in the same theme. And talking about theme. What about that theme song? Oh, my soul died a little bit. I don't even, this is just an abomination upon my soul. Why would you change it? Like the new visual parts are cool. That's fine. But you have the perfect theme song. Why? <laughs> and I have to go back into the news stories for the X-Men 97, but there's been a lot of comments about the X-Men the Animated Series theme song for X-Men 97, and I believe they've said, oh no, it's going to be a part. Now, I don't know if it's going to be changed or if it's going to be morphed into something. Like, I was watching Picard Season 2, because Picard Season 3 is coming out pretty soon, right? So I was watching Picard Season 2, finishing it, because I never did before, and I was listening to the intro theme. It is a consolidation and a combination of like all of the Star Trek all the way back to the original series to include the next generation, the movies and everything. If you listen, there's melodic themes in that Picard theme that is across the board. I kind of hope they don't do that with X-Men 97, but I really hope they don't do whatever this was. My grandma said, if it's not broke, don't fix it. It wasn't broke. Not at all. Not at all. And I don't think it was a rights issue either, but I don't know. I don't know if it goes back to the regular theme for the rest of the season or not, but I don't know. We'll see. So we got this phalanx thing, which I don't know what the origins of the phalanx were. I know what it turned out to be on Earth, but if you had to create a backstory, or maybe you know about the phalanx, how would you create that, Michelle? You're usually very creative in these. 
Um, it was just, I'm sorry, whenever they were like, you know, basically resistance is futile, prepared to be assimilated. I'm just like, they're the Borg? <laughs> I, I thought it was interesting. I mean, they're not exactly the Borg. It's more of like, nanites and i think around that time a lot of science fiction was very much the whole blend of where is for artificial intelligence going to go where are nanobots going to go what is the capacity of integrating brain chips into our brain like if you know the anime ghost in the shell how augmenting yourself is like the norm by putting in cybernetic eyes and making one of your arms biotech. So I think it's just an additional step of it's interesting how it, yeah, you could pop out individuals, but unlike the Borg, the, the Borg, you saw like all the individual Borgs, but with the Phalanx, it, it could be almost like this big liquidy thing like if you've seen Dar star trek deep space nine with odo and you find out where odo's from they're basically like this big sea of shapeshifters that they could just live like as basically like this big blobby sea or, or that they, they can come out as individuals so that kind of like what reminded me with the flanks they could be this one big mass or it could pop off itself and so i thought that was interesting take as opposed to just being a copy of the board i'm thinking what happened here is that when star lord was abducted there was some electronic tech that was in his backpack and then it got lost in one of the planets that they were trying to plunder and then some i don't know cosmic force lightning whatever got into that and then made it self-aware. You know, it started to multiply itself and replicate itself and made it self-aware. So then they created this whole society that was all like one big communal thing. Let's all get together and let's dominate the planet. And that turned into the ph phalanx and the desire to get the entire world. So I blame this all on Star-Lord. Wait, are you saying that the Phalanx origin is 70s disco? Yes. It also applies to The Martian because, of course, we know that Mark Watney only had 70s disco music with him. Blame it on the disco. <laughs> That's right. So, Chris, what did you think about our new pal, Warlock? Warlock is just an amazing character i love him so much in the comics just the the sheer power of what he can pull off plus combine that with the childlike innocence of basically everything because he is just new to everything here on earth it's amazing it's really weird to see him without doug ramsey here because those two are like tied at the hip best friends in the comics so seeing Warlock here by himself is a little bit strange. I also think that him and his portrayal here is everything that's wrong with children's television because you introduce this really cool new character and then they just go away, never to be seen again. It's interesting that you mentioned that a little bit because if you liken it to the series just a few years before, you know, the Transformers, the G1 Transformers, you know, they come from Cybertron, which is a whole planet full of mechanical or electronic beings or whatever. And we, in that cartoon, I know since then there's been a lot, but in that cartoon, we never really went back, right? So kind of a expanding on the theme of we're just going to pull this this happened out of nowhere and then we're not going to go back to it i think in today's terms that you would have to revisit that maybe later in the season like you're introducing something that then there's going to be a callback mid-season late season something like that wait from what you're telling me that just doesn't happen here and i'm not surprised it's just the way the kids TV worked back then. You know, you had to make sure that what you could see could be seen in a vacuum. 
like in a vacuum, like a shark vacuum? Yeah. Or is it a Dyson vacuum? Probably a Kirby if we want Kirby? it to be the most accurate. Not a Hoover? No, definitely a Kirby. Okay. So, Michelle, I have a question for you. At the very beginning, we get the whole Sabretooth thing, and Hank goes out with Jubilee to you know, stop Sabretooth. When Sabretooth is brought back in, and then Wolverine eventually goes to Sabretooth, he smells them, as Wolverine is apt to do. You know, he smells everybody. And he discovers that it's not actually Sabretooth. My question is, is it a controlled Sabretooth, or is this a phalanx Sabretooth, like a phalanx created Sabretooth, and the actual Sabretooth is held hostage somewhere? It's a shape-shifted phalanx to look like Sabretooth, and Sabretooth must already be in one of those bubble things, so the phalanx knows what to do and what to say. What gets me is that obviously Wolverine, they probably keep handing him the manual on how to handle prisoners, but he obviously just keeps forgetting it, especially because, you know, in science fiction movies where they go to the new planet and they're like, oh, wow, there's oxygen. Let's take off our helmets. It's like, no, you don't know what's in the oxygen. Okay. You don't. This is a case of, Wolverine is out there. I don't know. I'm thinking it's Sabretooth, so I'm going to beat him up. And then all of a sudden, hey, you're not Sabretooth. But he opens the door. Okay, true. Phalanx can like go into the walls and stuff, but he doesn't know that yet. And it's just like, uh, how about I'm just going to open the door even though I don't know who you are? Wolverine, it's just, you have the sharpest claws in the universe, but not the sharpest brain. Yeah, with, you know, the whole Wolverine, Sabretooth thing, we knew we were going to get into a fight at some point, because, you know, that's Wolverine and the focus of it. But I really liked the fake out that we did not go with a full Wolverine episode, and we actually went with a Hank-inspired episode. That was pretty cool, right, Michelle? Science! I really enjoyed having Hank be the driving force, be the one to escape the X-Mansion, escape the Phalanx with the help of Warlock. Ended up with Forge, who's another science guy, you know, in the X-Universe. It was just great just watching Hank be Hank through for two complete episodes and not have to hear Wolverine's bub and odd insults because they can't curse on a morning TV show for kids. It was just great. It was exciting. And then it showed kids that you can solve problems with science. I mean, you can also solve problems by using your brain and not just opening the door to your biggest enemy. I still think Wolverine should have just clawed the mess out of him and they could have showed it was a phalanx who is not a human. So according to standards and practice, that is something that Wolverine would be allowed to just tear the mess out of. That would have been interesting, but that's not the way they chose to go. And another thing they didn't choose to do is like name Warlock's companion anything else than Lifemate. I mean, really? Lifemate? That's the name you go with? But Warlock isn't even really his name either. It's just a title. Oh. So Life Mate is a title, not a name. It might be. Huh. So you could have actually named them Scott and Gene. Oh, dear God. (laughs) I mean, if you wanted to doom them to never being able to be together, then yeah. But I would go a different route. Well, if you wanted to go down that road, it would be Rogue and Gambit. Yeah, that would work, too. I like that. Yeah. Of course, you wouldn't be Rogue and Gambit. It would be their actual names. 
Oh, that's right. They have actual names. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Eventually, no, it's almost like they pick those names. It's like Top Gun. I don't know. It's Tom Cruise. It's Maverick. I know Maverick has an actual name. I don't know what it is. Val Kilmer's Iceman has an actual name. I don't know what it is. Goose had an actual name. I don't know what it is. I don't know. They're Maverick, Goose, Iceman. Uh, what? What? Are, oh, I just saw Maverick. See, look, they even called it Maverick. You know, they didn't call it by Tom Cruise's character's name that I don't know. They called it Maverick because he's Maverick, right? And so I'm making the argument that Rogue and Gambit are just Rogue and Gambit because that's my argument. <laughs> okay. You know, coming from the Air Force community where call signs are what everybody become, literally, you can have a three or four star general that has a call sign and you just go with the call sign. You don't go with their actual name. I've worked for three and four star generals, which you call them sir, but you don't call them general so and so. You call them by their call sign. So, yeah, from that perspective, I understand that. Now, when they go home, they're not called by the call sign. Like, you don't say Iceman, you don't say Maverick, you don't say Goose, you don't say Rooster. You, home by their actual names at home do you know that for sure though yeah yeah even couples that are both military they call each other by their real names at home yeah trust me i i know a lot i suppose there could be one or two that call each other by their call signs but for the most part if i had a really cool call sign i would want my wife to use it yeah i guess my call sign, I don't think was that cool. So we'll just leave it at that. And I wouldn't want to be called by my call sign at home. Your call sign is not, you don't choose your call sign. You are given, you, well, you earn your call sign by doing something completely stupid or completely heroic, but that's like few and far between. Usually it's completely stupid and that's your call sign. Or if your name is obvious that it's a call sign to something, then I guess that's one way to do it but normally it's you do something stupid and that's your call sign so like mine would be dribbles water because sometimes when i drink water i just don't get so if, so if you catch me like dribbling water my, my call sign is dribbles you would be dribbles yep okay great there's my call sign. But dribbles. you don't get to name yourself. Somebody else would have to catch you dribbling and say, hey, dribbles, and it just catches on, and that's your call sign. There are, in pilot training, there are actual call sign naming ceremonies that you go through or whatever, but usually you, know, it's, you do something stupid, and there it is. All right, so we've got... <laughs> She's going for it right now. <laughs> All right, dribbles. There you go. On the podcast, she's dribbling. There you go. Michelle is now dribbles. Back to the episodes. I do like the fact that we have this expanded universe of mutants. You have Sinister calling Charles Xavier asking for help. I mean, that's like, that would never happen in real life. Like, you don't have the, head of the the villainous gang calling the head of the cops saying i need help come here i mean it's just an happen. so it's kind of unique that it would happen in this super powered mutant thing well you have a unique level threat here the phalanx coming in is going to destroy the entire world i mean hank even said at the very very horribly timed moment wasting time getting onto the ship the enemy of my enemy is a good thing to go with here so they all if they want to survive they need to work together and this is not a time for backstabbing this is not a time for what did you do last week that made me mad at you this is if we're going to survive i mr sinister have to talk to charles xavier and get his help and then we have to go to magneto and get his help Yeah. 
It's Independence Day. <laughs> I love that movie. It's also uh, pretty cool. And I forget what we were watching. We were watching something over the holidays, the girls and I, and it had uh, the actor that plays the president in it. And I was like, it, the most famous speech is his his lines from Independence Day. And they they all looked at me like I had three heads. I'm like, you know, Independence Day, you know. And so, of course, we had to watch the the speech and the final battle and stuff on Independence Day. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Anyway. I liked how we get four. I think this is the first time, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's part of uh, the X factor or whatever, but we get Forge. We get Forge, like more Forge in this episode than we've ever gotten Forge before. Yeah, it's cool to have the engineer Forge. That's what Forge is really known for because he built his own legs, leg, I believe, and he, of course, did the time machine. After Beast, when it's on the show, he is the more scientific one. Technically, so is Sinister, but he's not a good guy. I mean, he's the best geneticist on the planet when it comes to mutants, which made sense that Hodge became the Phalanx's tour guide and knew to go after Sinister's mega mutant genetic base. So... There was this whole thing about the virus being introduced to counter the phalanx, right? They didn't consider any second order effects. It's just like, okay, this virus works. Well, what else does it do? They don't go into that. I don't know if they really have time to worry about that, though, is the issue. Which sucks, because yeah, you've got all these other things that could possibly happen, the side effects. But when the side effect of not doing it is the entire planet is dead, that might be a risk you're just going to have to take. I wonder if it did something good. Like it, it, like if you had a bum knee and you were absorbed by the phalanx, when you came out, was your knee all repaired? That would be kind of cool. Think of it in the good terms versus the bad terms. Now, it, like I said, again, in modern movies, you would find some bad side effect to this that would create the next bad movie or episode or whatever. Well, Cameron Hodge still had his metal leg and arm, so we know it at least doesn't go that far. We do get Magneto, and Magneto is kind of this this old man Santa Claus sitting up at the pole, right? And he's you know, sitting on his throne, the Santa Claus throne or whatever, and just like, Arr. he's even, I believe, wearing red or maroon or something like that. And he's like old crotchety. Ah, I lost my asteroid. Nothing matters anymore. And he's just this old Hager guy with the beard. But your son's in trouble. Oh, my son. Yes. Quicksilver. Yeah. Yeah. Should go help him. <laughs> What about yeah. his daughter, though? So she's one of the most powerful mutants out there, right? Technically, she could have handled the phalanx on her own, and we didn't need a virus. I think that's why they were like, maybe Scarlet Witch is hanging out with the Shi'ar, and she's off planet, because otherwise, technically, Scarlet Witch by herself could have handled the phalanx. Yeah, probably even what we know now as Captain Marvel could have done that as well, but probably Scarlet Witch would have been my choice because Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers, which is different in this version here, but the one we know from the MCU, Carol Danvers, is like force power. She doesn't have the power to transmute things like Scarlet Witch would. So Scarlet Witch was probably the better choice to handle the phalanx, in my opinion. If you're talking top-level tiered mutants, I mean, even Rogue had a problem, and Rogue does have Captain Marvel's powers in this, so she was even captured. All right. Well, do you guys think that this two-parter worked as the intro to season five? 
you know, just forget what you know about the next eight episodes. As an intro to season five, do you think this worked? I think this is probably better as just a standalone story. Really could have had it anywhere. I mean, is there an overall theme for season five? We don't know. Previously, we had the overarching Savage Land storyline. You know, we had follow around and get to know your characters storylines. But this kind of completely wraps itself up. So I don't know if it really works as an intro. That being said, I really liked it. As a first episode, it's like, where is everyone? I know, like, like in the beginning, you would have like an ensemble beginning, and then you would go into the whole, some of these characters are more prominent in these episodes, and then like, do the whole push some forward, push some back. This was, again, Loved Beast. As an opener to a season, no, I think there could have been a bottle ensemble episode at the beginning, just so everyone knows, here's the X-Men, and here's everybody who is still part of the X-Men that you know, and then the Phalanx episodes be two and three. They did have a head nod to Genosha. They went to Muir Island. They didn't do anything with space. There were a couple other things that they didn't do anything with, but they kind of looked at the landscape without looking at the landscape. They were just so quick with how they did all of it. It's really easy to miss it, especially for a kid's show of this era. I mean, I'm with Michelle. Like, lay everything out really plain, really obviously, and just let us pick this up in episodes two and three. All right. But also, I don't know how quickly this aired after season four ended. So the season distinctions might just be a nominal thing and not actually matter. I'm guessing it was like May. I'd have to go back and look at the air dates, but I'm guessing it was May. And then this is September. So normal season, you know, the seasons used to run September to May or or maybe June back then. So even though this was only 10 episodes, it started where the normal season started. Anyway, any other thoughts, you guys, Michelle? I thought it was interesting how Warlock and Lifemate do survive. Hodge talks about how digital copying and reproduction is just perfect. Well, in nature, you get mutations, but we've learned. Now that even when you make digital copy after digital copy, copy, there can be degradation as you keep copying. And Warlock and LifeMate seem to be their own mutation within the program. That was an interesting idea. I know the show didn't have the time to go into it. But when I was just sitting and knowing what we know now about like computers and how viruses work and malware and everything like that, to me, it made sense why Warlock and LifeMate were able to survive the virus that was just meant to target the actual phalanx itself. And how they were unique to begin with. Like, they didn't want to become part of the phalanx, as everybody else normally did. So, yeah, I could go with that. As far as the file stuff, hardware impurities can seek in there. If you have a good backup service, what they'll do is they'll take a look, you know, a cloud backup service. What they'll do is they'll take a look at the file. They'll compare it to a, a other file that was before that. You know, they'll run multiple backups so you have multiple copies of the file and if there's any change they'll revert back to what the original file was so that's a good backup service that does that versus just storing storing your file so it does happen naturally out there whether it's 
cosmic radiation that caused it. I know in space travel, that's a big problem or whether that is just a hardware problem where something doesn't work after a while. So you just get a bit that flips in a, in a file, rendering it unusable or rendering it as different. So anyway, that's an interesting way to look at it. Chris, last thoughts? We've kind of been warning all of you along the way that season five is kind of where the animation especially goes weird. and you do see some glimpses of this in here. I can totally forgive Forge's mustache disappearing every once in a while. I can't really defend having people walk without having them move at all. That's just weird. And get ready for that kind of thing because this is season five of X-Men 92. Yeah, we've done the research before. We know that they've flipped over to another animation house in order to save money. And it's just the way it was. I'm hoping that X-Men 97, I think, is being done internal to Marvel Studios animation. And I would hope that any collaboration between the animated series continuation and, and the rest of Disney, for instance, even, even though Marvel Studios animation department its own thing, they could still borrow from... Pixar or Disney or animation or whatever. So I'm, I'm hoping that we see something that's good and that we can live with. I'll give you an example the Clone Wars, right? The beginning of the Clone Wars, if you ever watch it, it's uh, Star Wars animation stuff. It's, it's very clunky, very early video game ish. And then it's developed into something. Why they didn't entirely change the style, it's developed into something that's a lot more watchable now. So I'm hoping for that for X-Men 97. Well, next time we're going to be talking about X-Men, the animated series season five, episodes three through four, as shown on Disney+. Plus. So if you're watching along, go ahead and watch those before our next episode. We'd love to hear from you on what you think about this episode, these two episodes we talked about, or the series in its totality, or if you want to get ahead of the game, the two that we're discussing next week. In the meantime, as Chris mentioned at the top of the show, we have a month full of Marvel Studio news to get to. There is a lot of information about ant-man 3 we've had new trailers come out there's talk about mill murray's character and how possibly ant-man could be you know how important it is to the next phase the story i'm going to talk about is ant-man and the wasp quantum medium director promises an epic and talks about how kang is a powerful force so Peyton Reed, director of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumanium, has dished on bringing the powerful villain King the Conqueror to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Reed discussed King's place in the pantheon of Marvel's greatest villains and how he approached adapting the classic foe to the big screen. Quote, in the comics, King has dominion over time. He's a time traveler, Reed said. His situation is a little bit different in this movie, which I won't spoil for you. But he's someone who, while we live very linear lives from childhood to death, Kang doesn't exist that way. It struck me as interesting to take the tiniest Avengers, in some people's minds, maybe the least powerful Avengers, and put them up against the most powerful force in the universe. End quote. I think it's interesting for us to learn a little bit more about Kang because we are getting into the weird multi-universe, multi-timeline stuff that Marvel has been known for. We, we got a taste of it in Loki and then in Doctor Strange 2. So understanding that Kang is one of these characters to where time really actually is a big ball of wibbly-wobbly things and how he lives the Jeremy Baramy life I think it's something that you need to understand before starting to dive into phase five. That's right. Five. We're in phase five. That's correct.
I've liked Ant Man because it has been kind of a silly is not a good word, but it's been a less serious thing throughout all of it. But I think that what has really highlighted that has been just the underlying seriousness of everything that Scott Lang is dealing with. And I think this is a natural progression of his story. And I'm just, I'm really looking forward to this. Plus, I want to see if we can actually get Paul Rudd to age. And I don't think that's possible. Yeah, I've kind of seen some aging in his face in the trailers. Now, whether that's digital or makeup or whether that's actually him, I, I can't say because Disney might be saying, no, we, we can't pull a Eternals here. We can't have a real life guy that's going to live forever sort of thing. So we need to age him a little bit. I don't know if that's true or not. Say, Chris, did you see the Modoc in the trailer? I did. I'm excited for that. Cautiously excited because Modoc is a character that they can mess up really easily. But if they don't mess it up, oh, that's going to be so much fun. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of communication online, a lot of stories, a lot of social media stuff about whether they liked the portrayal or not. It was in a trailer. It was like, I don't know, five frames or something like that. So really hard to get the totality of the Modoc head in there. And I don't even know what universe we're talking about. Are we talking about our, I don't know what you want to call it, 616 universe, you know, the MCU universe, are we talking about something else? Because we're going to get a lot. I mean, even the trailers showed what thousands and thousands or millions of Ant-Mans, right? So who knows where that Modoc came from, but it was really cool that we actually got a Modoc on screen. So that was pretty cool. And for those that don't know, Chris and I podcasted about the what channel was that on? It was like Hulu. FX or something. It was Hulu. Yeah, it was Hulu. Yeah, we discussed the entirety of the Modoc animated with Patton Oswald, which was it was a fun introduction to the character, even though it was totally not what the character usually is. But at least we were introduced to the character. All right. I'm looking forward to seeing what this is, because this is the official kickoff of season five, as you mentioned, Michelle. And we're going to get it's all going to be about Kang. The entire T of season or phase five and probably phase six. Kang has a, a definite thing that he wants to, to do, and everybody's going to try to thwart him, which tells me that this movie is going to end sad. There's going to be possibly some deaths, and Ant-Man's probably going to be in a position where he's not going to be able to do anything. So uh, even though they haven't said that, I think they're going to be taking Ant-Man off the board with this movie. But it'll be interesting to see how that all happens. Cassie's going to be in there. The Wasp is going to be there. So we'll see how this all pulls together. I'm excited. The visuals for this, if you take a look at the trailers, the visuals are just amazing. I can't wait to see this in the theater. And, and that's saying something for me, not wanting to go to the theaters for a variety of reasons. Pandemic is just one of them. And uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited to see it in the theater, just like I enjoyed seeing Black Panther in the, season, in the theater because of the visuals. And, and everything like that. Uh, something else that's happened since the last time that we recorded news, anyway, was that Jeremy Renner had found himself in an accident. For those that don't know, he actually has a tracked snowplow where he lives, and in the winter, he plows his own driveway, his own street, and he helps other people. And coming from a lake home up in wisconsin it's kind of the same thing everybody gets together and if somebody's stuck if somebody's in trouble then you go and help out even in my neighborhood in ohio if there's a big snow fall and you have elderly people that live next door you just go and, and you help them you shovel their drive shovel their walk and that sort of thing or, or plow or blow you know whatever you have well jeremy did that and then unfortunately his own snowplow ran him over as he was trying to help somebody else out. And long story short, because this happened weeks and weeks ago, he's recovering at home. He wasn't able to talk for a little while, but he's now recovering at home and he is getting better. 
And he's experiencing brain fog from the accident, which a lot of people that go to the hospital for major injuries because of a variety of things, just the trauma involved, the medication involved, that sort of thing. But he is progressing and everybody is wishing him well, especially since he found himself in the situation by helping somebody else. So have you guys been following this whole thing with Jeremy? Yes. Yeah, it's. It's tragic. It's an accident, but uh, he's he's getting better, which is good. I don't know if he's going to be in any more Disney Plus or Marvel screen things. How they left it with Hawkeye seemed to tell us that maybe there was more there, especially with his wife. But I I just I don't know what the future holds in the MCU with Jeremy Renner. So uh, hopefully he'll be able to come back on screen if that is one of the things that they want to do. I would encourage you, if you're listening to this, to go to our show notes, either at legendsofshield.com or in your podcast app that you can get into the show notes and see all the news stories that have occurred over the past month or so over the holidays, and you can link to them. But there's one in particular that Chris wanted to cover today that deals with a new development in technology and comics art in totality so it does affect marvel maybe a little less so but it affects all comics as well so the comics industry is taking a collective stance against ai art usage over at cbr.com you have an article starting off multiple artists and editors working in the comic book business have taken a stance against ai generated art One of the most ardent tweets against AI art came from Boom Studios acquisition editor, John Moison, who wrote out in one post, if you submit AI art to me in an attempt to get work and I find out, I'll do everything in my power to make sure you're blackballed from the comics industry. There's no room for frauds in this industry. And I'm friends with a bunch of artists. That is basically the line that I'm seeing from everybody. Like, if you're going to make art, then make art. If you can't make art, then the way that the AI art works is that it goes through the internet or whatever database it has. And basically, I'm really oversimplifying this, but it basically photoshops a bunch of images together to make what you've done. And it makes the image that you say you're looking for or what it thinks you're looking for. But it's doing that without you having to really do anything in the art creation process beyond giving it the prompts. The problem here is that it's taking art from people that has been already made. We already have a precedent that stealing art is bad. And there's already a precedent in the comics that tracing art for things is bad. Cough, cough, Greg Land. And you need to make the art yourself. When you're making this AI art, you're not making the art yourself. It certainly has its place in society. It's not something that I think needs to just have the technology ban and everybody using it as a horrible person. But when you're using it to make the art that you're trying to tell a publisher is your art and get published and get paid for it basically off of the work of other artists, then you, you're just a horrible person. And you're, the space that you're taking up can be better used by somebody who is making the art themselves. Yeah. Don't do that. Like, come on. I just can't believe. I know people are people and some people are just awful. If you can't break into the industry, then I'm sorry. I know it's frustrating. But you don't get the steal in order to make it. There is someone still in a prominent position at a comic book studio who I don't think should be in that prominent position at that Marvel. It's a Marvel individual who's still an editor. It's CB, right? 
who pretended to be a Japanese individual. I'm sorry, when he was exposed, he should have just gone away because he pretended to be a Japanese individual to get work. And now he's an editor at Marvel Comics. It's another reason why I'm not a big fan of Marvel Comics right now. But I'm glad someone is taking a stance saying that we will not accept this type of art. I'm all for the protection of intellectual property. I'll start off by saying that. I, I will foot stomp that. However, I'm going to take... Oh, I've been listening to this for a variety of different reasons. I've been listening to some technical podcasts as they were talking about this, which do have artists on it as well. So they've been talking about the protection of art and the protection of intellectual property. I've been listening to podcasts space about chat GPT, which is another AI development of you could actually create a podcast with chat GPT. Am I for that? No, I'm not. I mean, there, there are reasons for it. If you're putting out a podcast for just information out there, uh, it's no different than a, a news blog like The Verge or whatever, which The Verge has gone out there and they've created uh, CNET as well. They've created posts with AI created posts. They are largely edited because they still have to have a human review because these AIs don't give everything correct. They don't fact check everything correctly. They're learning. As far as the art creation, though, if the new way or a way to create art is having these AIs learn just like a student would in a school, and learn how to create art, or even on their own, by imitating other artists or learning about their techniques or whatever. And if the AI is doing that, and then you are learning how to correctly prompt, and Chris, I know you, you mentioned the prompts, this could be a new way to create art that your experience is in the, I know how to prompt this to get the style and the picture out that I want. I think that it is a valuable discussion to have. You still need to protect the original IP, whatever that is. But I, I think there's room in the discussion to enable this to be something that is used in the future for, in this case, comics. Now, how you do that and how you create and protect that original IP, I don't know the answers to that. I just know that I, I can kind of see a pathway forward where you can use AI-generated art through the prompts and still have your own creation of it. And then there's the whole question of, okay, who owns the intellectual property? Is it the AI or is it the person that's giving the prompt? I don't know the answer to that. I just... And I think there's going to be a path forward, which is going to enable this eventually, but I don't know what that is. And until then, I want to protect the IP that exists. That'd be cool if you you have you're an artist and you have a big backlog and you're using it to make your own art. Like if the AI is only programmed to go after your own art, that would be kind of cool. There's definitely a place for the technology. You know, use it for courtroom sketches for stuff. Use it for, hey, what did you see when you went out on patrol for your things? Like the technology itself, yeah, that's cool. I'm going to check it out. Like if I want to go make a profile picture for myself for social media, that's meh. Because just because I know people who make a decent amount of their living off of doing the art for that. But in the end, you know, it's a profile picture. Like, yeah, it's cool art, but nobody's going to sit there and say, oh, your profile picture, but that's the most important thing in the world. But to me, when, when the art is the end product itself, that's where I really don't like this AI generated art. We're going to continue to see news on this. We're going to see lawsuits as they progress. We're going to see the processes develop to utilize this correctly in the industry. And we're going to keep tabs on it because it's, it is going to affect 
uh, the creation of superhero or super powered individuals in animation, in comics, and quite frankly, you could conceivably eventually even create an entire MCU movie that is just computer generated from start to finish. You just say, okay, here's the plot, or maybe even you ask it, what kind of plot do you want? And it generates something. Kevin Feige says, okay, that sounds good. And then it goes off and creates something. It's going to put a lot of people out of work in the process. You won't have the um, the CGI farms with the terrible work conditions, but they won't have any work conditions because they won't have any work. But I, I could see that eventually happening. Now, whether that happens or not, I don't know. But it's a, we're going to keep tabs on it because this is something that's going to affect the industry of which we're fans of. And we'll just see how it goes from there. Interesting news story you picked there, Chris. I, I appreciate you bringing this out in the, in, the, in the open for us to discuss. Got to help make sure my artist friends can keep making their money. And if anybody needs art for things, I can throw names at you all day long. Well, and the thing is, you know, we say that there are only so many story arcs or plots out there or whatever, but we continue to get new stories, new and creative stories out there all the time and told in a variety of different ways, whether it's a novel, a song, a, a movie, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, an audio podcast, audio drama, whatever. We continue to get new stories all the time. I don't know if you turn it over to AI 100% if you're going to get that sort of continued innovation, right? So hopefully we will all right well michelle i think we've we've reached the end of our rope at this podcast so you think we should go and and go off and color my beard now oh indeed We want to thank everyone for continuing to listen and to interact with us over on our Discord server at gunnageek.com slash Discord. It's been really fun over the holidays where people are interacting with other people, talking about new series that are coming on. Last of Us is an example. And it's really just fun interacting with you. So we appreciate you being a part of this podcast and being a part of our Discord community as well. Yes, we always appreciate when you take time out of your day and listen to us. There are so many things you could be listening to, including the hive mind of the phalanx. Don't listen to them. They're mean. They tell lies. <laughs> Maybe they're the heart of the AI art. <laughs> All right, that's it for this week. Until next time, I'm SP. I'm Agent Dribbles. And I'm Agent To Be Determined. At least you're an agent. See everybody next time. Bye. 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 Ooh, what happened to your hand there, Chris? Kind of went off screen a little. Oh, yeah, that's where I cropped the video. Ooh. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2023.